One comment for the next talk. Uh, for those people that um, don't do hair restoration, don't worry. This is going to tell you, a lot, of, a lot of my colleagues have called me this last year, how do you do PRP injections in the scalp? And so this is something that you probably can incorporate in your practice. I have a recipe step by step and, and how to do it. So I think that's going to be in, encourage a few people that want to stay here and learn from uh, this, this, this course. Um, yeah, can you, oh, this, this is the advanced here, good. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about top 10 things going on in hair right now, and then I'm going to focus down on two things. The bioenhancements, which you heard Dr. Miller give a really good talk on, I'm going to focus on hair, and then FUE, which is a, a big craze, and maybe that's something you want to enter into. So I know those are the two topics you guys want to know if you don't do hair. And I, I usually want to give a lecture like this, it's the majority of people don't do hair. So the, the first topic is bioenhancement or regenerative medicine. You've heard a lot from Dr. Miller. I'm going to focus specifically on hair in this case. It's really changed my practice. In the last uh, five, let's so say 2001, so six years or so, I've been using regenerative techniques and I've been layering more and more and more. It has completely changed my, my practice for hair. Um, I wrote a, a first edition of my textbook in 2010. I rewrote the entire textbook in 2015 because of, I mean, a lot of changes, but this was the biggest thing. You can get results where, you know, all in one growth, and this is from a previous cancer skin graft, just incredible take in after one session, and this is using PRP, A-cell, ATP, hypothermosol. I will give you my recipe. So again, if you don't do surgery, I'm gonna teach you how to do this, and maybe this is a nice addition to your practice, so that, that way you don't feel like you're wasting 20 minutes here, and I usually will be under time. Um, the other, thing is that if you're getting, this is again something that you may want to, I don't know if it's going to help you in your face, but I always like for people that are in the room that get a few pearls from me that may not be doing hair, uh, and this is maybe one of them. You know, you guys have, are familiar with this, using hyaluronidase to help relax tissues, you know, when you're doing lifts and things like that or whatever it may be. Um, when, you, when I have a tight donor and I can't quite close it, I actually put a little hyaluronidase in there, one bottle of that, and mix like five cc's of saline just with a 25 gauge needle above and below the incision and that wound gets very relaxed. Now you don't want to use that on a, tr on a regular basis and try to escape danger but I have been able to take unclosable wounds and close them with hyaluronidase and just a little bit of about 10 minutes of wait time. So maybe if you're getting in tight wound closure situations this may be a trick for you. I, don't, I haven't tried it in the face but um, I don't know how it would work. Uh, the other thing along with better donor incisions besides really good harvesting which is the key central reason you get good good uh, beautiful incisions it's not the closure it's how minimal transection how much you preserve nerve and blood supply which is a whole another lecture but a couple pearls for people that do do hair is that i actually i'm leaving the the uh, 30 nylon or 30 proline in for i do a one layer closure i leave it in for 15 days I used to leave it in for 10 days. I'm seeing much better um, wound uh, results. I'm also using the platelet pore plasma, which we'll talk more about in a moment, and using that in the, the wound after closure, and I'm seeing much better results with that as well. And I'm using closer, tighter loops. So I know that you don't want to you know, close a facelift under tension, but with the, I think with the weight of a flap on the back of the, the scalp, since it's vertical, by placing tighter loops and, and, uh, and a cl tighter closure, I'm actually getting um, better wound healing. So very, very hard to see wounds. Scalp micropigmentation can be an addition just to place a little bit into a scar, and that may be an alternative for some people that don't want to do uh, grafts just to help improve. This is a hair transplant along with, uh, with SMP. Um, low laser light therapy, you know, it sounds like a lot of voodoo, but I'll tell you, I started using this a few years ago, and I'm, I'm really being uh, mindful in, in, in looking at patients using just one modality, because oftentimes you layer it with Propecia and, and Rogaine, and then you can't tell what the result is, and I'm seeing very favorable outcomes in isolated single modality therapy uh, over a period of a few months. The way this mechanism works is that the uh, the, it works around uh, 650 nanometers in range and it's low level therapy. It, it, it stimulates the cytochrome uh, C in, intracellularly and it, it helps reduce apoptosis, increase intracellular, intracellular growth. And so this is something that I have been very happy with and there's been some prospective, prospective multi-institutional studies back in 2013-14 that have shown some improvements with this. So this is something that I think you don't need to go and drive into a, uh, an office to do this anymore. So this is, you know, it's a good, uh, something that you may want to carry in your practice. I'm not here to mention any product names. 
uh, but this is um, something that may help be helpful in your practice even if you're not doing surgical hair restoration. I find it very, very helpful in my practice uh, whether people are electing to do surgery or not. Overplucked eyes, you know, this is a big trend. You see a lot of people coming uh, in for eyebrow transplants or for microblading or things like that or these really false tat fake looking tattoos that you can correct. One word of warning, I, I, I run a hair course. This is the single hardest thing to do. If you are thinking, you know what, hey, this is a good thing. I don't need to do like 3,000 grafts and a scalp. I'll start with eyebrows. You shouldn't be doing eyebrows, in my opinion, for the first five, six, maybe even 10 years of your hair practice because unless you have high volumes because this is really hard to do well. It's not just hard to do well from the surgeon's perspective, it's extremely hard to do well for the assistants. The assistants have to be extremely high caliber to do, do good work. Um, but you can really um, change people's lives because it really frames the eyes in, in a beautiful way. Prostaglandin modulators, a lot of people today, with you hear a lot of things on the internet about finasteride having uh, permanent sexual side effects, a lot of things that people are very, very scared about, especially in the very young population in their 20s. This is probably the next generation of what's going on right now. And um, it's interesting, a lot of this is coming out from, the, from Allergan, and, and one of the reasons is they're, they're doing clinical studies with Latisse or Bemadipros in, in different concentrations. Uh, last time I heard, that they haven't been able to uh, pass through phase through clinical trials because of dosing issues. But they also, interestingly, bought Kythera, and the Kythera has this one Japanese product, a prostaglandin D2 uh, inhibitor. So this is an alpha F2 agonist, but there's an oral D2 um, antagonist that is actually, I heard, is in phase three clinical trials. So this is something, for me, very promising and interesting for people that either A, don't want to be on finasteride or um, are, are thinking about, hey, what are, you know, what are other alternatives, what are things, that are, or even addition, you know, synerg because a lot of these therapies for hair are synergistic in fashion. So when you do a lot of different medical therapies, they all are additive in nature. People have shown that if you take finasteride for years and, and you take uh, minoxidil, there's a, an addition in terms of your improvement. And similarly, if you stop one of those modalities, you can actually have a, a, a loss because they're all synergistic, and I try to tell my patients that. So it's important that you know that. Other things that are not on a slide too is that um, I was in the, the, uh, the meeting last year for the ISHRS and just really blown away with a lot of the things with DNA printing um, that they're going on with uh, the, the, the really the, the hopefully something that we you, we use the word stem cells, we use the words um, uh, cloning which are, is, not, is not accurate but th this is something that Every year, where I think we're getting closer, and I'm always I'm just blown away with with, with the different mechanisms by which people are actually approaching that same same problem, having an unlimited donor supply. Female hair loss is a huge thing. It's it's either traction alopecia, as you see here. Um, you can also have issues with uh, chemotherapy um, loss. It can be just a high hairline, or it could be just uh, uh, metabolic loss. And uh, this is something that's really underdressed. And, and if you said, look, hey. Sam, I don't, do, I don't do hair transplants, you know, but I have so many female patients coming to me with hair loss. What do I do? You know, can, do I have to do a transplant? No, that's a very tricky thing, and female hair restoration is very tricky, and it's not just the technical aspect of the design of the, of the, the, the recipient sites. It's also a large part of the psychology, the metabolic conditions, et cetera. But this is one of those things that potentially you could offer them laser therapy, PRP, things that would be an addition to your practice. So again, I'm trying to cater this talk to not the hardcore um, guys out there doing hair, but if there are some of them out there, you know, hopefully you'll get a few pearls also uh, from this. And just, I think it's good to know the trends of what's going on out there as well. Uh, one thing that's been huge in my practice is uh, beard surgery of all types. So it's either going uh, transplants from scalp to beard using either FUE or FUT, which is the uh, now the colloquial use or the, um, it's the inaccurate use of, of describing a strip procedure. But, um, so either scalp to beard, um, uh, chest to scalp, scalp to, you know, beard to beard. I'm doing, I, I've done several beard to beards. Uh, and some of the advantages of beard to beard transplants is that you have no donor morbidity back here. Very little donor morbidity, surprisingly, with beard as a, as a donor site. And you get uh, color match, texture match, um, everything. So just, it's just really amazing where, where things are going right now. People that wear hair systems or, or hair pieces, um, don't forget that a couple things. One is that they're really a lot more natural today, and that's because they're woven coming out. So you, a lot of those old toupee thoughts that look really fake, 
they don't look so fake anymore. They look really, really good if they're well maintained. But it's expensive maintenance for, for patients. And hair restoration is a good thing where you can actually just build their temple. The one area where you really can't deliver too well with a hair system is the, the temporal. So I do, not many, but I do hair, hair uh, transplants into patients that are extremely bald, Norwood 7s that can't have a surgery, and I just do a little temporal reconstruction for them. Um, scars, facelift scars, where the, the, the sideburn is lost is a great small thing to do. And I think this is something if you're saying, hey, Sam, what can I do? What small thing can I do in my practice and just test, you know, test the waters? Uh, it's not going to be a female hair transplant in the first case and definitely not an eyebrow. But this is probably a reasonable first step if, if you're wanting to do something. Um, FUE is a topic I'm going to explore more. So the two I just mentioned earlier that I'm going to explore more in depth are going to be the, bio, the regenerative techniques, and I'm going to give you the recipe. You know, a lot of times we talk in these very abstract terms, and you walk out, go, "That sounds really good." I have no no idea how to incorporate this in my practice. So I'm going to give you the philosophy, what's the trends, and then I'll walk you through step by step the mechanics. I think all of that is important. So we're going to talk um, about FUE more in depth in a moment. Okay, so we'll go through that. Regenerative technique, as I said, is something really huge. A large how this started back was um, in 2000 and. 11, uh, when I was in, in Alaska for the hair meeting, I was looking at this slide from Gary Hitzig in New York and I was just blown away. It's like he did a PRP on one side, same closure, and I said, okay, I gotta try this. So I, I started this journey of, of looking at if this stuff actually works, and, and the more I did it, the more I was blown away that, hey, this stuff really makes a difference. And again, no financial affiliation with any company or even the books I sell, all, the, all of those are the, I, get, I collect no honoraria on my, on my, on my uh, speeches, my courses I run, or the books I write. All the royalties go to charity. Um, so we'll be supporting stopping sex trafficking and a lot of bad things in this world by, by buying the book, just to let you know that, but I don't get any money off of it. Um, but this whole idea of regenerative medicine has been a, a huge thing. I started with uh, this, this uh, Tologel system and um, placing the PRP at the very beginning of, of recipient site design and now I do it afterwards and I still see great results. I now use this angel system. The reason I mention these brands is people just want to know what do you use? There's going to be a question at the end so I'm just telling you what this is and I don't make any money from this company. Um, but the angel system allows me to titrate in a way that I can't with other products but it's a much more expensive um, centrifuge, much more expensive um, uh, uh, package all together and some of the thought was you needed to be at around 1 to 2x uh, concentration physiologic but now some thinking is 5x I'm between 3 to 5x I'll walk you through when I use a 3x and when I use a 5x and that means five times physiologic platelet concentration um, at, at when I'm doing it this is this fancy chart that uh, you don't need to even memorize but it's how I start thinking about um, how to dilute everything uh, Anthony Scalfani uh, gave a talk about how uh, platelet poor plasma, and this is actually his slide, uh, he let me use this, uh, of just how active platelet poor plasma is. So I think we, we think, you know, PRP, PRP. I use all my PPP. I use all my platelet poor plasma in the, in the case, and I'll tell you how logistically um, I, I actually use that product. So A cell. A cell is basically an extracellular matrix, decellularized porcine bladder matrix. And it's used in plastic surgery for burn victims and you know uh, fingers that are missing, et cetera, that they regrow. And um, this has been a huge component to my uh, how I how I'm actually delivering better outcomes. And I'm going to tell you how I've changed uh, since my last lecture. I've, I've actually increased my A cell, seeing even better outcomes. So I'll talk a little bit about how I use this. Uh, again, it's hard to understand this until I actually walk you through the mechanics of it but I do use it. So how do I do this? Uh, my mix for PRP and A-cellar and the and A-cell. The uh, for surgery, this is what I, what I, what I currently do. Um, again, there, as I told you, I've used other mixes, all of which has worked well. So you're welcome to take a, uh, well, I, they said no photographs, but you know, to be honest with you, I actually have a slide that says take a photograph. I, I would encourage you to take a photograph of the slide I'm showing you just because it's, you have to write all this down. But I basically take 120 cc's of whole blood mix it down down to uh, 14 cc's at 7% hematocrit. Now why 7% hematocrit? There's a lot of argument that you know PRP must be have no um, blood in it and I disagree with that and the reason is that there's I was talking to the scientific head of, of this of this company says that you know most of the active platelets are centered around that blood. In addition I'm not an orthopedic surgeon placing this into a sterile joint. I, the, I'm gonna have blood everywhere. So why the heck can I have blood there? Unless someone can tell me that, someone can come up to me and tell me this after my talk, I'd love to know why I can't have blood in this. But I, 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 I use 7% hematocrit because I'm pulling as much active platelet as I can. 
I'm mixing that with 100 milligrams of, of A cell, and essentially um, I'm mixing 14 cc's out of the usable, um, out of my 120 cc's spun down. So this is how I break it down. I have about five or 10 cc's of paleopore plasma left that I use um, in the donor wound after I close it. I, uh, I use 15 cc's of platelet pore plasma. You'll hear this in the next slide, or in a couple slides coming up, for my initial storage of my strip. So my strip comes out. That shock of taking a, a, a strip out, you want to put it somewhere physiologic. So I put it immediately into room temperature platelet pore plasma. So that gives that, minimize the shock. I actually learned this from an Indian doctor in a presentation last year. I said, that makes sense. Why should I put this into any other storage medium than, than its the own plasma right when it comes out? Then I have, out of that 14 cc's, I've got this 9 and 5 mix. 9 cc's of the PRP and A cell I'm using in the recipient bed after I finish making recipient sites. And I'm wearing goggles because that this stuff can spray because you have those little open recipient sites. And then I use 5 cc's for my graph. So what does that mean? That means, and I, you'll see the slide where I, I'm going to walk you through step by step for this, but I have, so right after, right before those graphs are placed into the, into the head, into the scalp, I just coat all the graphs before placement. A common question I get after, uh, after these talks is, you know, is it hard to place because of this coating? No, it's actually pretty easy to place. There's really no difference using PRP and A cell in terms of placement. Um, this is the slide that probably for most of you are most interested if you don't do hair restoration and you're interested in incorporating some level of PRP. Again, I've had multiple colleagues call me, so this may save me a phone call. Uh, but no, you're welcome to absolutely call me or catch me in the hallway anytime to talk about this. But it's, um, what I do is I, I mix, it's the same 120 cc blood I pull, and I pull about 30 cc's out, which gives me about a 3x concentration, and I mix 200 milligrams, so in other words, two packages of, of A cell. Um, and then I inject it, into, I put a ring block around the scalp. One ring block I really like using is articane or septicane, 4% with a uh, quarter percent ep uh, epinephrine. It really works well because it doesn't hurt as much during the injection, and it provides profound anesthesia. Uh, and I just do a ring block around the scalp with a little vibration device. The one caveat with septicane is you must know the toxicity levels. It, there is a toxicity gradient, so I actually have that. If you want to email me, uh, it's Dr. Lam, D-R-L-A-M, at L-A-M Facial Plastics with an S.com. I can send you my uh, the dosing for septicane. But uh, put that in, or you can just use lidocaine. I inject the PRP all over the scalp, you know, just a 25 gauge needle and then I massage it into the scalp to make sure it's equally distributed in the subcutaneous plane. It's just sub-Q. So people say, is it intradermal? I use, you know, hair bulb. I just inject it in the scalp. Then I use a micropen, nanopen. I honestly don't think the manufacturer matters, uh, but just, uh, sorry for the manufacturers out there, but just needle the bejesus out of this. So we're, I'm sitting there for about 15 minutes needling, 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 needling until it looks like a sunburn. And that uh, really will help stimulate the hair follicles. It, it's, and th there's always a question, do I need to do this seven times, 10 times every month? I have found a single time is enough. And how, when do you repeat this? It's when you start seeing the hair. So some people, they may need it every year, every six months, every three years, every two years. It depends on their rate of hair loss. So a large part of how I gauge a second session is I follow them, watch them, consult with them, and make a decision with that. So hopefully this one slide is helpful for those that don't do hair that may be interested in dabbling in this field without you know, getting texts and all that kind of stuff to do, do this with. Activation of it is so critical. This is the thing is that by, if you just stick the PRP and the A cell in there, don't do anything to mechanically uh, activate it, you're gonna have a problem. So you can use thrombin, but that, you know, that's an animal product, bovine animal product can cause hypersensitivity. You can use calcium gluconate. I just don't think that's strong enough. Um, you can even add a calcium gluconate, but really what I found that works in my hands when I'm doing a standalone non-surgical intervention is, is a lot of needling, so a lot of needling. And if people ask, can I use a derma roller? I've done that. I think it still works, but there's a lot of trauma to the hair shaft because there's a rotational injury, so I, I like to use, a, um, you know, the way I do it, I just do this up and down, up and down, up and down. And this is just showing some PRP results here. Uh, this is just showing you a gentleman that I did a, a surgery around 2011, the middle, oops, sorry, the middle one, and I didn't have great growth. I added PRP. Oh, my God. These are the ones that at that junction of 2011 when I started just adding PRP into a second session. I'm like, oh, my God, what a difference. What a huge difference. 
So the other thing I've been adding, I added this about two years ago, and so I can see in a staged fashion, this has been incredible. The liposomal ATP addition itself stabilized the um, potassium ATP pump, so it helps um, not let the, uh, the cells blow up. And really, when you're dealing with uh, ex vivo grafts, this, this has made a big difference. Again, I will walk you through how I use it, so don't, don't worry about uh, I'll give you the recipe in just a minute. Hypothermosol is a storage medium for uh, liver transplants and things like that. This, and combined with ATP, has been really, really awesome in terms of, of, of improving my take. What have I seen? I've seen my hair grafts grow earlier, and I've got, you know, I've got, I really believe, one of the best assistant teams in the world in terms of their, their care. But since I've added ATP hypothermosol, besides earlier growth, I've seen finer growth. Because I think the, if you have good techs, they really should not cause almost any trauma during, for the insertion of the grafts. But, I think the mechanical element of just placing a graft, no matter what it is, especially delicate FUEs though, you can have trauma. And using these, these regenerative techniques, have actually I've seen the grafts to look cleaner. I mean, and I'm so anal with looking at my grafts, so I want you to understand that I'm getting very good graft growth and beautiful grafts, but these make better graft looks. So I encourage you, if you haven't incorporated this, to think about it. This is my mix uh, coming up of how, of how I do it. So take a photo of this if you like. Um, this is a cleaner slide than my old slide. It was really busy. I try, hopefully made this easier. So what I do is I, I take 50 cc's of this uh, liposomal ATP. I take 10 cc's of ATP out of it, mix it with 100 cc's. That's how hypothermosol is sold together, okay? And, uh, and then you see the one, two, three down the bottom. I'll explain how I use the one, two, three there. So, and then I take 40 cc's of the remaining ATP, mix it with 400 cc's of plasmolite, and I, I take 300 cc's of that mixture to spray on grafts and just to keep everything moist, spray on the scalp. And I take 100 cc's of this and put it in a little bottle, give it to the patient, and they spray themselves every hour after the procedure. Uh, and now I'm making them stay up all night for the first two days, but even before I did that, they were still getting good growth, so I, I don't think it's critical. But you just want, what I've heard is that, and there's no real scientific literature to support this, it's more anecdotal. The first two to five days of constant spraying with ATP to minimize that shock is really, to me, an important thing. And, and also, what's really interesting is that uh, one of my colleagues found that placing graphs, um, placing graphs uh, in, into a hypothermosol ATP in the fridge can lead to a 96% survival at two weeks, just letting it sit there. I mean, that's crazy. I mean, think about it. You should have all your graphs dead in 24 hours. So this is, I think this regenerative techniques for graphs is a huge thing. So the bottom of the sl slide here is, I take the donor strip, I already told you this in a previous slide, uh, and I put it in 15 cc's of PPP when it's out. Then I take the sliver and the dissected graphs and I place it into, uh, in, into, these, into the mixture on the left, the 10 cc's of uh, ATP and 100 cc's of hyperthermosol. Uh, and then, as I said earlier, to incorporate that earlier slide, I coat the grafts prior to placement with the 5 cc's of PRP and A-cell. And then, uh, I'm going to skip over some of these things here. 